Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you the best way to validate your options or your settings in your .NET application. Now that is one of those .NET features that many people don't use and they should because not using it leads to your application failing at the wrong time having a real impact for your customers and for your system. In this video, we're going to explain all that and I'm also going to show you what I made to validate my own options. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell and for more training, check out nickchapses.com. All right, let me show you what I have here. I have a .NET 7 application over here and this is just a basic skeleton of an ASP.NET Core application using the web application host abstraction. It doesn't have any endpoints, it doesn't have any configuration, it doesn't have anything. Now, the thing we're going to be focusing on is the settings. Now, they can be in an app settings.json file, but they can also be in some third party service where you control it through a portal, it's going to be into a secrets manager, it's going to be into many places. But the main idea is that anything loaded into your ASP.NET Core application on startup like this is considered a setting or an option based on the terminology that ASP.NET Core uses because it uses the options pattern. So an example would be that I can have a section in my options and I'm going to call that example. So that's my example name section and I can have some value here, for example, log level. Now, what I use this log level, I don't know, but I do know that this log level actually is reflected to the log level object over here, the enum. So it can be critical, debug, error, trace information, none, or warning. And that is basically it. Those are the valid values. But since this is just JSON, I can go here and say log level neck. Nothing really stops me. Now I'm going to use that and I'm going to create a new object over here to reflect my option. So I'm going to say example options over here. Now a very good idea is to actually create a public const string for all of your options and create a value called a section name and the name we want here is example so this name over here actually matches this many people like to do sort of like name of and use the name of the type so example options like this I've seen this fail quite a few times because when you refactor the class, you refactor this, but then your app settings aren't automatically refactor, leading to the breaking of the binding. So you really don't want to do this. And now that I have that, I'm going to create my property. It's going to be a required string property since I'm mapping it from a string. I could map it if I wanted to to the enum, but I'm going to use a string for a reason here. So I'm going to just say string here. And now to bind this in my application, I'm going to go to the services. So I'm going to say builder.services.add options with a generic parameter. I'm going to say example options, and then I'm going to use the configuration. And let me just say config.builder.configuration so it doesn't get too long. And I'm also going to break line here and say bind. So bind into that options object, the config.get section. So I'm going to get a specific section. And I'm going to say example options dot section name. You can even get a required section, which leads to an exception if the section doesn't exist. I'm going to use just get section here. And now just to visualize this, I'm going to add an app dot map get endpoint, which actually loads this object. So I'm going to say hello here and I'm going to inject it. But now it is not just the raw example options object. It is an I options example options object. So I'm going to just return options dot value. And that is my object. And this is very important. I've seen many people actually use dependency injection to resolve the options and then register it as a singleton. You don't want to do that. You want to use the pattern. You don't want to go around it because this is not the only benefit. You have other abstractions like options monitor, options monitor cache, options factory, options snapshot that also benefits from this approach. So don't get around it and just inject the service, just inject the interface instead. So now that we have that, I'm going to go ahead and just quickly run this application and the application starts fine. This is very important. Obviously, there will be no way to map this into a log level, but my app did start. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to open this call.http file and make an HTTP request from here. So log level is Nick. How is log level neck? I don't know. And if I go back and I actually say that this is a log level, so I use the proper type and I rerun the application, then watch what happens. Application just starts, right? No problem. But if I go and I call it, then I'm going to get an exception saying invalid. I could not convert the thing into an enum. And now the user says 500 for something that should have happened 
on startup. This is the problem we're trying to solve here. We want to be able to validate that values that are not supposed to be set in those respective settings or out of bounds or whatever are validated correctly and earlier. Let's see how I can do that. I'm going to go ahead and just stop the application and I'm going to go down and I'm going to say dot val. And now I see three things, validate, validate data annotations and validate on start. It's very important. Let's go ahead and use validate on start to see what happens. So if I just say that and I just run, then the application will actually fail because the value was tried to be resolved and validated on startup. So my application never actually start because trying to resolve the setting, the system failed. But something like this will only work when the type itself has logic to be validated. In this case, this fails because we're trying to map a string that doesn't exist in the enum. So the enum says, okay, what the hell? But if I say string here, or if I go a bit further and I say required int retries, right? And I know that retries in my system can only be from one to 10. You need to at least have one retry and you can only go all the way up to 10. So how do we validate that? Because I can go here and I can say retries, no problem. And I can say minus one. And if I change this to information so it doesn't fail, and I run this, then on validation, nothing wrong happens. And I can go ahead and I can just call this because minus one is acceptable. So how do I validate this? Well, this is where the validate method comes in. So I'm going to say validate and I can say x dot. And now in here, I have a full object, the full options object, and I can specify my own validation logic. So I can say if retries is less or equals to zero or more than 10, then return false. Otherwise, return true. That's the only thing we're validating. If I also needed to validate the log level, I would do that here. But now if I do that and with validate on start, then I'm going to go ahead and run this. And as you can see, this doesn't start because it says validation error has occurred. It's not really explaining what happened. If you just see a validation error has occurred, which is pretty bad. I don't like this but we're going to be fixing that. But clearly now we can validate our options on startup, which is great. If I did not have the on start here uh, and I run this again, then I would only get the exception when the dot value thing is actually called. So now that I call this over here, now I get an exception. As you can see, a validation error has occurred. Now that is a fine approach, but this can get quite bloated with all the different things you might want to validate against. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually comment it out and I'm going to use a better built-in way to do this. And that is with the validate data annotations method. So now I can go to my options and I can say that this thing should actually be in a range. It should be from one to 10. I don't remember what I said. Did I say 10 or nine uh, equals? Okay, let's say nine. I think in the beginning I said 10. And if I want to do the same for the enum that is represented as a string, then I could say that this is an enum data type of type of log level. And if I do that now, both things with the validate on start thing in place will be validated on startup based on their attributes. So we're going to say run the application. And now this fails because with a better message as well, because the options retries was actually not between one and nine. Great. This is a great way to do this. However, even though this is technically fine for simple situations, it is not my preferred way of doing things. And the reason for that is because I generally prefer to have a dedicated object describing how something can be validated and have all that logic there and also allow for more flexible logic and not have to use annotations on the options object itself. Now, that is just my personal preference, but with the technique I'm going to show you now, you'll be able to plug in any sort of custom validation logic that you want for your application. So how do we do that? We can't really inject services in here. So if I want to inject, I don't know, some API key validator service that calls an HTTP endpoint here, I would have to do some really hacky things where I resolve services before my app container is built, which is just terrible. And also you can't really do that with data annotations. So how do we solve this? Well, there is a NuGet package that I personally prefer using for validation and it's called Fluent Validation. Now that package allows you to do tons of things flexibly and fluently, but how do I inject it here? Because there is no options fluent validation package. Well, 
my approach when it comes down to thinking about those things is, okay, how did they do the validated data annotations bit, right? There must be something in this extension method. So first I go here and I see, okay, first they register a singleton of I validate options here, and then they create a new data annotation validate options object as a singleton. Okay, so I go here and what do I see? Oh, I see something that implements the interface. It has a constructor with a name and then it has the logic. It has a validate method that returns validate option result. Okay, so I just checks that if the options are valid and then if they are success, if they're not, it adds them into a list and failure. So I'm actually going to do the exact same thing. And here's how this goes. I'm going to add first the Fluent Validation NuGet package. Here we go. And I'm going to create my own class with the extensions. So I'm going to say Options Builder Fluent Validation extensions in the same wording as the data annotations thing. And I'm going to make this static because this will have my extension method. And I'm also going to make my other class here, the public class fluent validate or validation. And in the same fashion as the data annotations one, this will need to implement the I validate options and it's going to have a T options object. And of course, this needs to be coming from here. Now I'm going to implement the missing member, which is just the validate method. And this is where my validate options logic goes. Now I'm actually going to copy a lot of their own code because why not? So technically I can just really rip everything from here and just add it here. And I'm going to completely remove things like requires and reference code and so on, because those things are really only used um, to guide trimming tooling, which we won't be using. If you were to do this properly, then you would also keep these attributes in place. The reason why I remove them is to make it easy for you to watch the video on how the code hangs together. So this just at first glance looks fine. This throw helper doesn't exist, but we have argument null exception throw if null. So this should be doing the same thing. It's just a guard clause. I'm going to remove this comment. I'm going to leave this one over here and I'm actually going to comment out all of the rest. Here we go. So ultimately what we need here is to inject an I validator for this T options. And we're going to do that through this extension method. Now, if I am to copy what they did with this method as well, I'm going to go here and just paste it. And I want to say not validate data annotations, but validate fluently or, you know, using fluent validation and so on. I'm going to remove this long attribute over here. We don't need it for what we're doing. And obviously I don't need a new data annotation validation. I need the fluent validation options here. And I'm going to leave this as it is. I'm going to go at the bottom and say return validate options result success. So no matter what happens, just say yes. And I'm going to take a breakpoint here and I'm going to go to the program.cs, comment this out and say validate fluently. So this on startup should actually come in here and try to validate all the options. Here we go. So this thing will come in. Name is empty. Options are not. You can see the options here. So information and minus one. And we're just going to say success. So the thing will actually just run fine. And this is where we're going to plug in the validator. Now, first, I actually need to register the validator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, in fact, and use the dependency injection extensions fluent validation NuGet package, because this will allow me to do it using assembly scanning. So automatically, so I don't have to be explicit about it. So I'm just going to say builder.services.add validators from assembly containing, and we're going to say containing the program.cs. Here we go. And this will automatically register all our validators in the DI container, which means I can then go into the validate fluently method and use them. So what I can say is new line this and try to get the service provider. And then I'm going to say coma s dot get required service. I validator of type T options. Now this is going to complain that this constructor doesn't exist. So we're going to go here and make it exist. So private read only I validator of T options. Here we go. So I'm going to say validator and we're going to inject it from the constructor. And now this is happy. And I'm going to go to the bottom and just rip off the logic that they have. So try to get the validation result, which is validator.validate or validate async, but we're going to use validate here and then pass down the options that need to be validated. And then if validation result is valid, then return success. If it is not valid, then just loop around all the errors, generate a nice looking message and just return that instead. So now with all that in place and I can go ahead and just 
delete all that as well. I'm going to create my validator. So I'm going to say example options validator. And this will be of type abstract validator with example options as the object. I'm going to go to the constructor and create a rule for. I can specify what I want to create a rule for. I'm going to say log level first. So create a rule for log level is in a name of type log level. And that will validate for that. Or I can say rule for retries. And I can say inclusive between one to nine. And that is it. Now, the last thing I need to do before I start this is a bit of an implementation detail, but it's good to know. Here, this iValidate options object is registered as a singleton. Now, depending on how you use your validators and how pure the validation process is, you might want to tweak how your validators are registered. So, for example, in this case, by default, my validators are scoped. But if I said singleton over here, I can override this. And if I do that, I can go ahead and I can just debug this, no problem. So, system now runs, thing comes in here, it's going to start validating things. Validation result will be false because retries must be between 1 and 9. And it's going to create an error message and just return it. So the system never run because we validated the thing. And here we go. If the name was also Nick, then if I go ahead and I just run it, as you can see, both of them will fail. Both the log level is not within the range of values that do not include the value Nick and the retries must be between one and nine and they were minus one. So that is an awesome way to plug in Fluent Validation in without having to use any hacky ways or any weird methods. Uh, and again, if you want to get more control over your validators, for example, registering your options validators as a singleton, but the rest of your validators are scoped, then you can always just manually register your validators. You can just say add singleton i validator of type example options and then example options validator. And that is it. And you can wrap that logic if you want, or you can merge it into the validate fluently method. That's completely up to you. But this approach is fantastic and super clean. You can have a dedicated class with all the instructions on how the thing needs to be validated. And I've seen applications being saved by something like this, because if you don't have it in place and it goes to production and it just runs and you kill a good version of your application to have a bad one, which will eventually fail because your user will not be able to process the requests, then that is very bad customer experience and you're going to lose money. And also errors like this can take down your application, which will keep it being in a loop that ultimately always fails and you have to fix. So put this in place. It's really, really handy. And you can use anything from custom validation logic to regex to whatever you want. It's, it's awesome. But now I want to know from you, were you using something like this? And has it saved you from a disaster? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making videos possible. If you want to support me, you can find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe for more. Click the like and hit the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.